Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Mafia and Gangsters video. Well, originally I was going to make this video within my Mysteries and Disappearances playlist, mainly because it featured a person who ended up disappearing and was never found again. And so truly that would have been something tied to that playlist. But when I realized, of course, that this was a person that was also involved within the world of the Mafia, not 100% directly, but still in an almost direct Direct manner of sorts and on top of that he's tied to an infamous film that has to do with the mafia I just thought to myself I had to include it here within the mafia and gangsters play this a special treat in other words for everyone that continues to make this series a really really good success and on top of that my very first video also had Another person tied to that famous gangster movie, in that case, when I did my video on Spider, which I'll include the link for below if you had a chance to, to check that out. But yes, I realized all at once, let's do it here. Let's put in the Mafia and Gangsters movie and have it be with a character who still remains so fascinating to this day. Not just because of his real life exploits, but of course, what was represented there within Goodfellas. And I'm talking about this. You're looking at him now. I think this is actually the pretty much the only known photograph of associated with him and it has to do with martin krugman he went by a nickname otherwise known as marty krugman so let's go ahead and let's talk about all the fascinating information associated with this guy and then of course his eventual disappearance many many presume and many links tied to uh the mafia having a hand in it now as far as marty krugman who he was where he grew up Again, a lot of the information remains limited, but here's at least where some of it occurs. So apparently he was born on December 30th, 1919. And as he grew up, he grew up in an area called Passaic, New Jersey. And he grew up with some immigrant parents who eventually moved over to Valley Stream, New York. One can think and link that once he had that New York move, it collided his world along with the eventual world of the mafia, which of course ended up having some unfortunate uh, occurrences later on. But as he was growing up for himself, for Marty, he suffered from a condition that was called hyperthyroidism. And apparently there was another condition as well that was called exophthalmos. Whoa, these are uh, strong words, exophthalmos. In either case, though, the condition was this. It caused him to have these bulging eyes that protruded more than normal from his face, which in turn also caused him to have to wear goggle-like glasses. This in turn caused him to look much older than he was as a youngster. And then on top of that, he was considered very, very skinny and balding at the same time. So imagine all of those items all at once. And that's essentially what you have with this younger Marty. But in any case, the way he was growing up and what was impacting him from this stuff, it seems to never have impacted him, at least from a social standpoint or from a driving standpoint, like when it comes to a career, because he found a wife, a wife named Francis Francisca, who he married in 1954, and then he eventually started to use his business acumen. He was someone that was actually pretty good when it came to numbers, when it came to business, to, and he opened up several hair salons and also stores involving wig accessories. In fact, that was his big thing, too, that he was famous for, and then he made it into a little mini empire of sorts. In fact, he was famous for having those commercials for one of his stores that was called Four Men Only. It was a two-story store that was located there, apparently in the Queens area, and it was actually, again, a close link to his eventual world and the mafia. But yeah, he was able to use the funds from that store, the success of it, to do a whole bunch of advertising on the public television there within Queens. Apparently, it was a... A monumental like success like it was one of those commercials that people just love seeing um, and I'll talk about more at least on the movie Goodfellas the one movie I'm referencing on the famous gangster one here in a minute the commercials there but yeah this foreman only he would play himself he would have cheesy monologues cheesy stuff and it would just it, it definitely did its trick it got people interested especially men with regards to his plays and the other thing that was a niche there was this he only 
hired, apparently, female hairdressers, and they wore very, very low-cut blouses. So, revealing clothing, beautiful women, and then having it be just for men-only customers, you can kind of see still why it became a success. And the commercial and everything else from it just pretty much ended earning him a lot of business. But yes, this area, this store was actually next by uh, next door to an area that was called or a couple of blocks that was called from the suite. This was a place apparently where some of the mafiosos, some of the more famous ones including Paul Vario and his crew, including uh Tommy De Simone and then of course uh, Jimmy Burke and then of course Henry Hill, all of the famous big wigs from the movie Goodfellas and then in turn from the book wise guys they would all visit that location because they happened to be nearby and then somewhere along the way the way i was reading the information his store eventually ended up becoming an area for them to not not 100 discuss business but do some form of business involving bookkeeping or some other type of illegal activity so reading this information it made it seem like he in turn, using again his acumen, the one he what he could do as far as numbers, he was able to get this stuff run through that hair salon and wig shop and do some kind of bookmaking and sports books operations. And that included the mafioso people, that included their quote unquote clients, and then it also included people that were within other legitimate items, like those that worked at the JFK airport, and those that worked at several union jobs, and so forth. So somewhere along the way his areas just happened to become the go-to location to make these type of bets and people knew that if they made the bets with him then that in turn would cause things to get done whether they won or had to pay up in other words his area became uh, for it and then that's what he would take a cut from it and then in turn he would also have to give a cut to Paul Vario and then some of the other crew that were there because again they were in turn leading some of those customers there and then also he would use their influence and their help and when he in turn had people that were let's say not placing not keeping up with their promised bets so maybe they lost and maybe they were due to pay Marty but he in turn you know being so small in stature being skinny just unassuming unthreatening he could intend you to uh, turn use the audio crew and others to uh, to be able to get that stuff better. In fact, it was seemed like um, once everyone knew that that's what he was doing, that it made his business even more better. In fact, he even had a place there that was called, interestingly enough, the Wire Room. He also had one of the earliest known speed dials, at least for consumers. There were speed dials for businesses, but not for consumers. But he had one of those installed there. He even had some of the mafia people there. Apparently, Paul Vadio himself would purchase some of the wigs there. And then he would have others that would, uh, within the mafia crew, that would buy wigs there as well. So you can see how they kind of ended up going hand in hand. He made them money. They made money for him. And then uh, one thing, though, that was interesting was that he forbid any direct dealings. Like, in other words beatings, murders, anything like that that was really extreme um, from happening within the shops. He considered those off limits. But anything else that was just above the line, like in this case of being um, illegal, they would still run through there and then he was fine. He was um, not somebody that was connected, but he was someone that was still was that was considered an earner, someone that was able to do all this. And it was interesting too is that he made some good money, but he was wise enough to kind of stay quiet about it. He never flaunted his wealth, maybe because he wanted to also make sure that, um, you know, since he was so business savvy, he wasn't just someone that was going to blow through all of his money like you saw within some of the other mafia movies, how they just get thousands of dollars and then it's gone by the weekend and so they have to do it again and again but at least he in turn was able to make it a continued success interestingly enough though apparently jimmy burke and i was reading in one area and then another area too kind of had a thing for him from the beginning like in terms of anger and that was because jimmy burke was kind of convinced that uh, this guy this guy um uh, Marty Krugman was withholding additional money that he was owed and somewhere along the way just Jimmy Burke just kept thinking this and it just never got out of his head and that led of course to some of the horrible things that happened to him afterward and happened to Marty because of it but otherwise eventually some of those people 
that were working there at the JFK International Airport, apparently they became so in debt with their gambling habits and they in turn, you know, just couldn't do anything about it. One of them eventually started telling Marty about the things happening within the airport, about the shipments coming in, untraceable money, stuff like that. And so that's where the Lufthansa heist eventually came from. In fact, he was able to tell what the information he had, he told it to Henry Hill and then Paul and then he in turn told him to um, Jimmy Burke and some of the others. And that's how it came about to be when it came to that infamous heist, that huge heist. They ended up getting, of course, a lot more money than they anticipated. And I don't think the figures have ever been nailed down. When it came to how much you know the actual thing was associated with the Lufthansa heist, but my understanding it was a lot more than originally anticipated. Like I think it was going to be a couple hundred thousand, but it ended up being a lot more. And then of course drew the extra heat. Once that happened, that was pretty much it. You could almost see that there was writing on the wall for Marty Krugman and his relationship with Jimmy Burke. This was because at that point Burke was so paranoid, as you see now, of course. In the Goodfellas movie and then the, the Wise Guys book, the one from Henry Hill, he was so paranoid that not only again was Marty withholding money from him from the sports books, but that he in turn might be able to leak something or have something done that would connect more. From, from the crew to the Lufthansa eyes, something that he was trying to avoid, that he wanted him killed. Um, and this was something that Henry Hill infamously tried to stop and just tried to delay. The movie was correct when it came to showcasing that. In fact, at one point, it was just towards that night that, that the plan was to get him killed, but ultimately he decided, no, that's not going to happen. It was stopped. But unfortunately for Marty, he just had to still keep driving things like when it came to bothering and pestering um, uh, Jimmy Burke when it came to trying to get what he felt he was owed. Ironic though when you think about it, Jimmy Burke in his situation felt that Marty was ripping him off and then Marty in his situation was felt that Jimmy Burke was ripping him off as far as what was owed because again there was Nobody knew the amount, how big it was going to be whenever they did the Lufthansa heist. And all of a sudden, it's a lot more than when it was. So even though there was that initial night that things were saved, um, it turns out, though, at another fateful night, that's where it ended up being pretty much the last of Marty Krugman. And as it happened, he was hanging about. He was asking what was happening to Stax. Remember Parnell Edwards, the guy that was played by Samuel L. Jackson within the film? Well, he knew that he had been killed at that time and that at this point Tommy De Simone had also disappeared but still he just kept pounding and hounding Jimmy Burke to try to get his extra share of the money. Who knows how it happened but eventually um, Burke met Marty Krugman at a location called Azaro's and then that's where he was killed. Although the details remain murky at best because the only people that truly know what happened are pretty much all dead. Jimmy Burke is now dead and he never confessed to anything as far as what occurred to Marty Krugman. And then, of course, Marty Krugman is dead. And then whoever did the actual killings, they haven't confessed to anything on there, too. But the way the story goes was eventually Marty was called and promised that they would have some kind of money given to him at a location or he had some money coming in and he had to go to a specific spot in order to pick it up. And so when he did so, he told his wife about it and then his wife was expecting him to come back and of course when he didn't that's when the wife knew something happened to marty krugman and then that's when she went to henry hill because henry hill was still a good friend of marty and so that was someone that she approached immediately to try to find out what occurred and then that's when um that's when henry hill knew that something happened to marty krugman because of jimmy burke's infamous relationship with him there was nothing that he could do about it and so he just pretty much almost played dumb whenever that occurred other than that though his disappearance has pretty much stayed the same nobody has found out whatever happened to him the only testimony that's even you know loose at best is the fact that at one point marty's body was buried there at a location next to spider no doubt the guy that i was mentioning earlier there at robert's lounge in the back area associated with the uh bakji set uh the bocce court and then apparently that's where their bodies were temporarily buried dismembered buried there and then they were taken out again whenever the heat was on as far as that location 
and then buried it someplace else. There's also another area that I was reading that apparently they were buried within the floor basement. So imagine having to tear up the basement, take the concrete out, and it was underneath there, but nobody was able to confirm that that's truly the case. And yet in another area, I was reading that Marty, on the infamous night he was killed, he was dismembered, taken to a chop shop area, and then pretty much just placed into some form of a concrete I think it was like a concrete cylinder or concrete can, one of those things. In other words, it's a big can, big metal can is empty, body dumped in there and then poured concrete and then just threw within the ocean and then that was the last anyone saw of him. But ultimately, nobody found any whereabouts as to what happened to Marty Krugman. Presumably, he disappeared around January 4th, 1979. And he was never found and declared dead in 1986, legally declared dead. I was even reading some information on it where apparently his wife, his now, uh, you know, uh, surviving spouse, had to go through some hoops associated with the insurance uh, because um, they were giving Carter a little bit of a hard time as far as her being able to declare him dead. But of course, with no body found and him not being alive anywhere else, then that's where it was found afterward. Now, as far as Goodfellas, he was, of course, infamously played there as a character named Maury. This was uh, Marty's uh, version of whatever that character was within the film. Very memorable scenes associated with it, especially when it came to not just the cheesy commercials that I was mentioning earlier, the one that showcases the wigs that never fly off in a hurricane and then of course jumping in a pool to showcase how how good it lasts in there but obviously quick edits show that otherwise he never really jumped within the pool and then also the store in of itself you get to see some images there it plays pretty close to what it was within the film i'm sorry within the novel wise guy as far as their relationships but otherwise it kind of plays things a little differently as far as to how he was killed because i forgot to mention that earlier too he was either garroted or he had the ice pick done to him or he had both of them and so I've, I've read various versions again the only people that truly know are all deceased and there's no way to know 100 percent fact like what happened to him but he was infamously played within that that movie and he remains a hallmark a treasure when it comes to all the scenes associated with uh that actor so really really great stuff as far as good fellas and it gave its due this goes to show that that even a tiny character like this still has a memorable uh, set of scenes that still stand to this day the film in itself of course is a classic but the scenes involving maury i believe the film the film had to change certain names uh, from certain characters in order to ensure that the surviving members family members wouldn't sue anything as far as the use of the estates but yeah the character maury still remains very very famous uh, along with some of the other minor characters like spider and billy bats and so on within the film but that's pretty much it that's all the quick information i could find as far as martin otherwise known as marty krugman i was reading one last thing too and i wish i could have found the article again but alas i couldn't it stated that for all intents and purposes, like I mentioned at the very towards the very beginning of this video, Marty was pretty successful. Like if he would have just stayed within that hair salon and the wig store and then maybe doing some independent bookmaking of sorts, he would have been as is successful like he would have grown old he would have had good money he would have had someone I mean he had a wife and apparently mistresses that he flaunted around here and there. He would have been someone that, again, for his condition, his stature, I mean, he was already someone with wealth and success, and it could have stayed that way for a good while, but there was just this itch within him. He just had to have that lifestyle that he saw, I guess, as more risque, more adventurous, more something along lines of danger as far as the mafia. And so once he incorporated within it, it was almost like the deal with the devil. There was no way that he could truly get out of it without meeting some bad misfortune. And that's essentially what happened to Marty at the end. We don't know again 100% what occurred, but clearly with 
the way the things happen from the world of the mafia and then uh, Henry Hill giving his account of things. Um, that's pretty much what we know about what occurred to him. But had he not been involved within that world, he could have had a whole other level of success. He just had that itch that he couldn't let go. But in any case, again, that's all the information I can find. If anybody has any more info, anything else I might have missed, then please post those comments below. How about that, too, if you've seen the commercials uh, as far as the infamous four men's only the cheesy commercials that used to play apparently back in the 70s or so then please post those comments too i'd love to be able to hear what your thoughts are too all right everybody thanks again as always take care